You are listening to Musings with Morales. Brought to you by Dialysis Education Services. Welcome to Musings with Morales. I uh, hope everybody's having a great evening. Uh, it's early evening, 4.30 p.m. here, actually. And uh, I'm just realizing Paco asked me to stop saying the times and dates of our <laughs> of our podcast to make it easier on him on editing. But I got to say, you know, um, this is one of those days, Paco, that... Uh, I, I got a little bit of angst. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I think I've been telling you that, you know, I've got a verbal commit mm. from a rock star. And uh, it, it's, it's hard to coordinate when, when you live that rock star life. But I, I got the verbal commit from this gentleman quite a while back. I've talked to a lot of folks that have joined us as guests on the podcast. They've been looking forward to this day. Dr. Yasser Kazi. Yes. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you so much. So let me give a little background. Um, I met this gentleman about, uh, say, a year and a few months ago uh, at a professional conference in, I believe it was Palm Springs. Uh, I immediately was captured by the amount of information that you shared in like the, sh the short meeting that we had. I think we chatted in the hallway for a few minutes about some of the things that are going on with global nursing, some of the shortages in the United States. I caught instantly that education is absolutely your thing. Uh, since then, I've met several existing and new friends, even here on the podcast, that have run across your path and have raved about the experiences and the encounters they've had with you. And most recently, uh, I guess the anniversary of our meeting at the same conference in Palm Springs, uh, I had the honor of sitting in on your presentation again and just thinking to myself that you gave about two weeks worth of information that was like would be in a formal class in an hour, and I think most of the audience was able to retain. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to come out here, Dr. Kazi. Appreciate you, man. Of course, man. Thank you so much. And um, uh, my sincere apologies. It's taken us a year, but... Uh, <laughs> well, there's the uh, date. There's the time, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I do want to also congratulate you for all the initiatives that you have taken. Um, and this goes both ways. And uh, me recognizing what you have been able to achieve in the chronic kidney disease and stage renal disease space uh, in such a short time, listening to your story and, um, you know, trying to bridge the gaps that exist in every part of it, whether it's education. Um, I love your facility um, out here Thank and you. where you're like uh, training folks, uh, you know, your commitment to it. And then like doing these uh, podcasts, which, you know, get the information out there uh, to patients. So honestly, I was really excited um, to do this. And I, you know, you've been so patient with it. Uh, hopefully this was worth the wait. A hundred percent. And I, you know, when, every time you tell me I've been patient, it's like, no, I, Again, just having the verbal commit for me was like, wow, guys, uh, you know, the, the time that this person puts in um, and the outcomes of what you're doing with your work, I mean, I'm just so glad that we've got a little bit of time with you. So, you know, let, let's kind of think objectively about the evening. You know, really want to dive into your journey, uh, Dr. Kazi, understand, uh, you know, your insights, your personal, I guess, kind of flavor um, into your work, but but also, what are some of the critical advancements? What are some of the best practices when it comes to uh, transplant as a whole? Um, I want to find out kind of how you, what you specialize in as far as your transplants. Um, but again, objectively, let's learn a little bit about you. Let's learn a little bit about the recent advancements, and let's take a, 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 look, a look at the best practices. But let me start with one question, and, and guys, we're going to get to a lot of the uh, nuts and bolts behind transplant. Um, if you're thinking about transplant, if you're on the list, not on the list, what are some of the things that you should consider? I really like to get that from you, Dr. Kazi. But something that I've always been interested in, Dr. Kazi, how many lives can a single donor affect after death? Oh, that's such an amazing question. It could, the answer is hundreds because. Hundreds. In addition, when we talk about um, a donation, and again, um, there is such a critical shortage of organ donors in the United States, 
that every donor that basically uh, decides to donate, in addition to the major organs, like, you know, um, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidney, the intestine, um, the pancreas, um, there's tissues, there's bones, there's vasculature. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, folks can have tendon repair. Somebody, you know, has a tendon that is repaired. So it's absolutely amazing the number of individuals, um, individual uh, lives that can be impacted as a result of a single um, donation. So, That's crazy. Hundreds um, of lives from yes, a single. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Uh, because, you know, we usually focus mostly on the major organs, but there's like mm -hmm. absolutely tissue and bone and uh, tendons and so many other things that uh, go into it in addition to the ones that you hear in the news. It was just on my, um, I guess, Instagram feed uh, yesterday about a, uh, about a dad that was um, meeting the recipient of his daughter's heart. Oh, wow. Uh, and so, you know, they were putting on the stethoscope yeah. and, you know, you always, you know, you see these stories. In fact, last year, I don't know. Do you know the song that won the Grammy of the year? I, I, maybe I do. Maybe, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't. I'll play trivia with you. But anyway, it was about a. <laughs> it was about <laughs> it was Bonnie Raitt's song about a recipient of a heart transplant. Okay. And so uh, he was coming in to say thank you mm -hmm. to the mom. So it, it, it may be Taylor Swift, uh, DJ Khaled, everybody else. Yeah. But it was the song again. Um, you know, to the point that um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a quick story. So many years ago in Netherlands, there was a, a show, a reality show, mm. kind of like not like the Keeping Up with the Kardashians, but it was a show called the Donor Show, where a person wanted to donate a, a kidney, but then she wanted to like have people tell them why she should donate to them, mm -hmm. and kind of like the Bachelorette wanted to eliminate one. Yeah. one by one to decide yeah. who to just give it to. Mm -hmm. And it created a lot of an uproar. Now, this is not right. Um, you know, Fox News talked about it. Everybody was talking about it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the show, the producers came out and said this was all fake. This was just to increase the organ donor shortage awareness. And next day, the number of people that signed up to become organ donors just went up by... That's uh, crazy. Yeah. So again, it's like podcast like you like stories like yours that come up and we talked about a mutual friend about right. his journey to getting yep. a transplant yep um you know it does bring out awareness on like uh the lives that can be touched to answer your question um just by one act of donation that that's amazing uh hundreds of lives and, and you know just talking about that exposure you know really the main reason why we're here saying having a podcast, totally uncomfortable on camera, on audio, all that sort of stuff. But I, I don't hear enough, you know, conversation. And, and what I would say, Dr. Kazi, is, you know, we're hoping that w we would be exposing people who don't really think they need to be exposed. Uh, because quite often when you know that you need to know something, it's too late or it's at a point where it's critical. Um, so we want to kind of have people knowing before they fall into these uh, kidney failure, heart failure, whatever it might, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, knowing kind of the end of it. And I, I had this really crazy thought on the way here. It's like, you know, you, you, you get exposed to a lot of people in your life. And most of those people, you know, they bring fun or amusement or things like this. And, and, but when they get exposed to you, like when they meet Dr. Kazi, right? Like that's a different, that's a different scenario, man. Like I'm not like super religious, <laughs> but I, I just got to, you know, have this feeling about meeting you. And, and I couldn't help but think that, you know, if there's anything that's close to like, you know, an angel, <laughs> oh my God, um, the oh transplant surgery, oh you know, like, my God, like, the, like, again, w when do they meet you? Uh, yeah. So. I think from my standpoint, I, I literally, I just can't get used to um, how blessed I am and what I get to do, mm -hmm. right? So at a time that the world is just falling apart, and I just had this discussion before I came here uh, with our new manager that just joined, that just joined and she's uh, not had transplant experience. This is the first time. So I was kind of giving her a little bit of an introduction. You know, she's been an ICU nurse for like over 26 years. She told me like how um, I feel like it's such a blessing because, you know, and that's exactly what I told her. I said at the time that you see the world falling apart, like all these crazy things happening, it's just division and this hate. You have this act of 
this beauty of human donation where somebody yeah. says, I don't care who you are. I don't care you're straight. I don't care you're gay. I don't care mm-hmm. you're Christian, Jew, Hindu, Muslim, whatever you are. And here's my organ, and I don't even care who this goes to. Yeah. And then the, somebody receives it, um, and they don't know who, who this came from, but it transformed their life. I mean, I can't think of a better way in like get something giving me hope in, 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 in human beings in terms of like this selfless, unselfish act of trying to go save somebody that they've never met. I'm glad you put that, that <laughs> lens on it. I mean, yeah, they meet you, but... Also, you, you've, there's this intermediary in that, right? Which is absolutely a blessing for me, but then it yeah. also makes my job so hard because no place else in medicine do you have to guess the disease of the donor that you've never met, yeah. right? You have to make sure that were they healthy enough? Did they have like good kidney function? Did they live a healthy life? Because I have somebody that has waited on dialysis for a long time, and that's where it becomes so important, and that's why... We want to train more people um, in transplant and the art of transplant medicine and the importance of like, how do we like, you know, right now I have my phone over here because I'm on organ offer calls and I yeah. can open up the list of all the kidneys. And in fact, with the hurricane, the, yeah. I was thinking this morning, the first yeah. kidney offer came from Miami this morning. Oh, gosh. Um, so again, so then like, oh, is there going to be a flight that's going to bring this kidney in time? How long will it be on ice? So like, mm-hmm. there are so many things that go into like having to... Um, kind of like make the final decision. Yeah. And that's where the challenge is. Like what you basically talked about is like you know, the thing that you so eloquently talked about. Like, you know, you tell people go uh, look up X, Y, and Z instead of you trying to give them a book knowledge. Because yeah. a lot of this at yeah. the end of the day is like I was lucky enough to be trained by people that I like. I, I, I don't know that I would have had this training if I didn't luck out to be with Dr. Rocco Minuto in Buffalo or Eli Friedman in Brooklyn. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, so, yeah. you know, those things pass along. And then you always have to be a student. You know, mm-hmm. you always can never think that um, that you've known enough. You Every day you want to learn new stuff that is coming out because uh, there's been a big gap for us to, like, have anything in our, in our field, whether it's uh, CKD, ESRD, transplant, and that's completely changed in the past six, seven years and yeah. making it one of the most exciting fields in medicine right now. Agreed. Agreed. So guys, stick around. We're going to get to more of that. Just, I got to say, somebody messaged me today and said, you know, uh, I'd really like to know kind of the evolution of that criteria, what we're looking at. And I I looked up some of your, um, like what the content that's on uh, YouTube about you and and how you've impacted some of your colleagues. That's definitely uh, an area that you have been I guess you're noteworthy at looking at the criteria and looking at it maybe in a different way or a, a new way. So we want to get to that, but but let's let's uh, step back. You know, um, I've had the chance to see you on several conferences and uh, always one of the more pleasant people to be around. Always, I walk away with something as far as a new bit of knowledge. But uh, let, let's talk about kind of you know the the background. Um, I know you have a rich cultural background. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about that, kind of like, you know, where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Sure. Um, those sort of things, you know, cultural influences, values at a young age. Um, and then let's bring it to a you know to the peak with, um, were there pivotal moments or piv- pivotal experiences that brought you to where you're at today as a transplant surgeon? Transplant nephrologist. Transplant um, nephrologist, so, sorry. Um, Thank you for it. Yes, of course. So. Uh, I did grow up uh, in a family of medicine. My parents were both physicians, um, um, a lot of family members, um, uh, my sisters, uh, you know, everybody was a physician. So, uh, and I grew up in multiple countries. My parents were traveling a lot, um, you know, helping set up medical schools in different countries. Oh, wow. uh, um, so it was one of the best things that happened to me. At that mm-hmm. time, it was the most miserable thing because <laughs> every two years I was getting Pick plucked and out and yeah. I was learning a new language. So I have yeah. all these report cards as a child my dad trying to explain that you know this wasn't his primary language he'll get better so i was constantly challenged uh about like you know I, i'd make friends and then every two years we were moving along but my family's originally from Kashmir. my grandfather okay. came here um in the 60s he lived in texas actually last year me and my daughter were trying to find the house that he actually lived in knocking on doors and all that stuff and then my dad came in the 70s and we kept moving our family kept moving back and forth um, until we finally came, um, uh, moved back in, and I trained in um, upstate New York. And during my 
my medicine residency, I was just like impressed by the knowledge of the nephrologist. Mm-hmm. I, I always mm-hmm. liked medicine. I wasn't um, the guy that would just want to do a surgery and never want to see the patient. I loved the fact that I had a relationship with the patient. So I, I wanted to be there for the thick of it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I always say a patient is called a patient because they're so patient with <laughs> what happens. And nothing, <laughs> Hopefully, uh, te- yeah. nothing tests you more than having an illness. That's right. And nothing tests yeah. your family more than having a chronic illness because it doesn't just impact one person, it impacts the entire family. Um, so I loved the nephrologist, but then when I went back into nephrology, I'm like, oh my God, there's not a whole lot happening in this space. Like I, uh, I, I just couldn't just agree to telling people their kidneys had failed and just do dialysis. And there weren't many therapies to prevent kidney disease. There wasn't the acute ICU nephrology that existed. And um, really sh- quickly I decided I wanted to do transplant, but there weren't a whole lot of transplant fellowships. Uh-huh. And um, somehow there was one spot that was open in Brooklyn, but they had never taken a candidate outside their own program. Okay. So I'm like, I have nothing to lose. I go there and somehow uh, Eli Friedman, who's one of the biggest names in transplant, yeah. Yeah. Um, I end up getting a fellowship by discussing Pink Floyd and the music of Pink Floyd with him. That's another story for another <laughs> podcast. But somehow I ended up being the first guy that they had ever taken outside of their own program. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, in Brooklyn. So I moved from upstate New York to Brooklyn uh, and I trained there, which I think was the best thing. And again, something that I was talking to, uh, you know, the new manager is the fact that um, it was a county system. It was a Kings County system. Okay. It's like global medicine. Mm-hmm. Like in upstate New York, it was like a patient population. You had you know Caucasians, you had African Americans, but then you came to Brooklyn, and the King County had like you had to have a mindset that you were a global physician, okay. uh, and not just like you know up for like a particular subtype of yeah, uh, yeah. demographics. And that was, I mean, I was like, wait, what are they talking about? This can't be it. And then I, it was such a it was such a blessing to talk about the pivotal moments that I felt like um, uh, defined my career. But at that time, I also realized that, you know, Buffalo didn't have um, a pancreas transplant program. So mm-hmm. I wanted to get trained mm-hmm. uh, in pancreas transplantation as well. So I asked my program director and she set me up to drive over to New Jersey. And it was, uh, you know, I printed a map quest. I went there. It was such a small hospital, but it was one of the biggest in the country. I thought I showed up at the wrong place on the first day <laughs> because the hospital was so small. And again, it kind of was really important for me to realize you don't have to be a big health system if you have a good team, if you have a dedicated number of individuals. So St. Barnabas Transplant Program, where I trained for my pancreas, is still number 10 uh, uh-huh. in, in the country in terms of transplant uh-huh. program. And it's not like a big, huge... You know, it's not a USC or UCLA yeah. or yeah, yeah. you know, big health system. But again, you have individuals that are committed to making things happen. And that's what was another important thing that I realized that you don't need to have. You just need to have like everybody passionate and good about, you know, their particular part. And you'd be able to have a successful transplant program. So then I got back into Brooklyn, uh, back into Buffalo to start the first pancreas program, which we started the first pancreas program over there. Um, and then I was at a meeting in Mandalay Bay in Vegas, and I bumped into the USC uh, transplant surgeon who had mm-hmm. originally liked me a lot. And um, and then, then I moved over to Los Angeles in 2006. Very nice. So Ellie Friedman, uh, I, I think back to him and just kind of thinking about the, the Pink Floyd, which we'll find out <laughs> about later. He, he's the same Ellie Friedman that made like the suitcase Yes. Uh, right. Yes. <laughs> the suitcase dialyzer. Uh, Actually, his not friend dialyzer, was uh, machine, yeah, right? Yeah. So uh, the original inventor of the dialysis machine, who basically was ni- he would come to our conferences in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. and because he was just like a, a, an amazing individual, um, Bill Kolf. So he would come in. Uh, again, this is like almost. Did uh, you say who did you say? Bill Kolf. The the, the, the Willem Kolf. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so so background, Paco. I didn't. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, Willem Kolf. Uh, Colf rotating drum, like the yeah. first successful dialysis treatment, right? Yes. After more than a dozen, right? Yeah, eleven. I think eleven. The first was eleven died. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you had a you had your presentation. Yeah. 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 So that's it. So wow. So yeah, I've actually met the guy. He who was Eli Fried. Eli Friedman would bring him over to meet up wow. the uh, staff and kind of go over uh, and, and you know uh, it was just amazing because he was still. 
I can't remember what other things that he was inventing. Was, yeah, he's done quite a bit, He's right? quite a bit. So he yeah. would come in and demonstrate it. Um, so it was just uh, uh, to, to that point, like, it is so important, like, who, who you train with. Yeah. Because it does yeah. influence you in, like, a, putting you in a completely different mindset. Uh, mindset you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it, uh, we had a recent uh, podcast with a few friends, uh, a couple of them that are undergoing dialysis and... Uh, one thing that one of the gentlemen said was, I, I really love a, pro a progressive nephrologist. And just kind of my understanding of Ellie Friedman um, was that he was on, that, sure. on that fast yeah. track, right? Um, so you mentioned a daughter. Uh, tell me about family life. Uh, you know, um, are, you, are you spoken for? Uh, you know. <laughs> no, so I, I, um, I um, have three kids. Oh, wow. And they're um, older, they're in college, so, you know, they are um, independent and on their own. And yeah. so, yeah. So so you, they just ask for money now? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> actually, I changed uh, my, I used to have, uh, I put my last name, I changed my last name into the last four of my credit card with the, oh, group, with the group chat. <laughs> got you, got you. Um, you know, as a father um, of three, right, did you say they're all girls? No, no, two, uh, a boy and two girls. A boy and two girls, Okay. So I, I have four, two, two and two, um, you know, successful, uh, impactful, uh, community based, uh, what are the, you know, the lessons that you strive to impart on, on your three children at this point in your life, they're adults, what, what's left? Oh, for sure. Uh, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I always say that we have such a finite amount of time that we can be meaningful individuals. You know, it takes mm -hmm. so long to get to where you are in learning a skill. And then you have a finite amount of time that you want to be able to, um, you know, that craft that you tried to hone over years and all that stuff. So you have to be like really passionate and you have to care about everything you do, uh -huh. and I do. I mean, I, I if I'm playing soccer with my son, I mean, we, <laughs> we went to a trip in Kashmir, and they kept talking about this kid that was supposed to be the best soccer player. I'm like, I was like hustling, and my son's like, what are you doing? I'm like, dude, I'm sorry, I'm the Kobe of everything. I'm gonna, if, if it's like soccer, I'm gonna You're hustle like on this. You're competitive, huh? Yeah, I'm competitive. I'm not gonna just like, you know, if you say that he's the best, then let him <laughs> be the best. I think the only thing that I uh, uh, want folks to be is to know in your heart that you have done the best you can do um and you know many times i'm talking to a patient and it must have been a crazy day because i was taking organ off for calls and i think about oh my god they took all the time to come over there like uh, sometimes like oh is it really worth it yeah. to even bring this up it's not then i force myself to do it because i don't want to know in my heart that there was something else that i could have done or uh, left there, out there. So look, as long as we do the best we can, and you know everything else just rolls out on its own. And yeah, yeah. That, that's the most important thing. Like, you know, do the best, be the best you can, um, and try to be, a, uh, and uh, try to do to people what you would want them to be doing to you in terms of the good. Yeah. Uh, and everything else comes automatically. Everything else follows. So uh, you know, people say. Um, oh, I'm out here just to like, you know, for patient care and all that stuff. But then I know there's like, you know, secondary gain. There's something else in the back. Yeah. But if you do really make it about like, hey, I'm doing this because I absolutely love. Nothing gives me more joy than like making someone's, uh, someone else's life better. Uh -huh. Everything else automatically just comes. And I really do believe that. Yeah, I, I think you gave, you know, a, a lot of solid life advice there. Um, the, the the thing that really stuck out to me and and I, I I grabbed it as soon as you said it is just that that finite time, and and the, it takes a certain period of time to to hone in your skill as well. So it's like you got this. I don't want to say it's uphill then plateau, but I mean you got this point where you get to maybe potential, I guess, uh, and and then you got so much time to really use all of that, right? Not and then you you continue learning, of course, but. I think it's really, you know, it speaks to me and that like, you gotta do the work. Um, you gotta uh, kind of go through the trenches. You gotta be a student. Um, there's a time where <clears throat> you have to be humble. Um, and I think a, a lot of people from, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right, always, <laughs> that's, the, that's the time, right? But I guess what I'm saying is that I, I, I feel like we're in a day where a lot of times that people only see the tip of the iceberg um, and they don't see how much work needs to be put in to get to the point where 
that they're able to make these sort of decisions that you're making on a daily basis. I mean, as you're sitting here and I hear your phone pinging off, you know, it, it makes me think then, okay, you got, you honed up these skills. Um, now you're living the life of Dr. Yasser Kazi and that, that's gotta be hectic, man. Like, uh, every time I've seen you, even at conferences, like, it seems like you're still back at work. Back, back <laughs> at work. Right. So, so tell me about that. Like, how do you balance it out? Is there a time where you turn off? Uh, so it, it kind of like, you know, it's been a bit of an evolution, right? You know, back when we trained with Eli Friedman, Rocco Winudo, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, uh, I had just had my, my son was born and I couldn't afford like childcare. So by five, six o'clock, I had to go pick up my child and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. And then Dr. Venuto would still be there. And like everybody knows in Buffalo you're leaving because you put on a big coat. Yeah. It's the winter outside. So everybody knows you're leaving. So he'd turn around and say, bye, Kazi, see you tomorrow. And I would feel so guilty. Like, I'm like, oh my God, Dr. Venuto is still here and I'm leaving. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to wear a coat. I'm just going to roll out on a white coat. He wouldn't even know that I left. <laughs> so then I would leave and there would this uh, medical records would see me because there would be a snowstorm outside and they'd be seeing me going in a coat. They're like, hey, doc, we need to buy you a coat. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, no, I have a, a coat in the car. <laughs> that's just my doc, escape. <laughs> that's my escape. And so then many years later, I saw Dr. Venuda at a conference and I'm like, well, I just got to come clear to you, clean to you that this is what I used to do. I'm sorry. He's like, no, 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 man. I loved you. I come back to Buffalo anytime you want to and all that. So the point is, like, at that time, we didn't have the concepts of, like, you know, some of these work-life balances because the people that um, were uh, w mentoring us were just, like, absolutely machines, machines uh, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. And then you kind of, like, uh, think about it, and it's like, you know, there is a point after that you can be functional, so you have to, like, figure a way of how, how yeah. not to. Yeah. Um, I've just transitioned recently, about two years ago, into the, the Provident Health where I'm running the transplant program. I'm the only transplant nephrologist over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am passionate to, like, grow it. So, yes, you've seen me all wired up yeah. uh, in, in, during this because... It's like something that I'm doing uh, on an ongoing basis until I can get the systems and I can train enough people yeah. to kind of like do. Eventually, that's what you want to do. You're running an operation here. Yeah. You don't need to be here, but right. you know that the philosophy, the vision uh, that seeps through the wall so yeah. when you're not around and all that stuff. So yeah. I'm not there yet. So that's why you see me trying gotcha. to get there. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, it is, uh, you know, it is a very, uh, the transplant field is like we rely on getting called when you know somebody, someone became an organ donor. So there's like a urgency to it. You have to respond. You get like a certain amount of time that you have to say whether you're interested in taking that kidney for your patients or you feel like it's not something that you want to take for them. So there is that timeliness um, that, um, so I have a special tone for my phone when I know it's an organ offer as opposed to like somebody gotcha. that I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. If you're calling me for a podcast, I'll ignore it. Well, <laughs> you know, hey, <laughs> Which now I, did now, my now I know. Just, uh, I didn't get the special tone yet and that's okay. No, but, no, you no, know, I, I think what I just heard is no, you don't turn off. No, I don't turn off. That's crazy, man. I, I, for now. For now, yeah. for like hopefully another six months or so until mm -hmm. like we, we've just hired some more staff and all that stuff. So it should get better after that. Stay healthy, man. Yeah. <laughs> Keep drinking water. And uh, you saw me take your water. You did. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll start an aspirin soon. So, so uh, yeah, on, on that note, I mean, OK, you don't you don't get it turned off. Um, we've we, you know, we've messaged enough to where I, I've caught you like at a football game, I think, or, or yeah, I think it was a football game. Might have been a football game. Yes, um, it was a football game. So what, what do you do like to, to let loose? Like, What's fun? Um, so yes, I uh, do love to watch sports. So um, I am a season ticket order to my USC Trojans. Nice, uh, so nice. I go, um, so you should come um, tailgate with me sometime. Sure. Um, I do um, love, actually, my son does not like to watch uh, the Buffalo Bills with me because I keep <laughs> yelling at the organization. I can hear like, uh, but we're like Bills fans. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, so I do mm -hmm. um, um, follow them and watch them. And then ever since I moved to L.A., some of the L.A. teams that I like. So I, I, I kind of like do like sports a lot. So I do, okay. um, I do anything outside of football. Uh, I love concerts. I love to go to concerts and um, some of those things. But I also travel quite a bit. Uh, so I love to go um, to like uh, multiple, you know, uh, cities within a year. Uh, okay. Just like short trips. And I'm, I'm trying to get on that kick now. Yeah. We <laughs> just should be together. I would love to, man. Uh, so I, I got to make a joke here or, or just kind of bring something to your attention. Like, uh, I know nothing about sports, man. Like, like, it's been so long since I've watched any game. 
and uh, we know some mutual friends. Uh, some of those mutual friends make fun of me, like w when they'll be talking sports. Like Mor just Morales doesn't know what you're talking about at all. Uh, I've had a hard time turning off too. Uh, but l I, like you talked about loving what you do, I, I do. And and uh, whether it be um, on the education front, whether it be what I do in medical device, whether it be what I do it through just trying to bring awareness, um, I don't feel like I'm working, so it's it's a lot of leisure. The one thing I can say is travel. That's I, I admire you for that, and I'm again. I'm trying to get more into that. Maybe take at least a couple trips a year. So we're planning our next one. Uh, you talked about influence, and and how really trans transformative it can be. How significant it was in your life. Um, you know, what were the key lessons that you took from those mentors? You mentioned some of the work ethic. You mentioned kind of, in my words, I guess the the innovative or progressive approach, but in your words, what are the key lessons that you took away from your strongest uh, mentors? Uh, that's such a great question uh, because, you know, as I mentioned, um, for the longest time in the kidney space, there weren't a whole lot of therapies that were coming in. Yeah. Um, so you kind of had to like innovate uh, and try and improvise the patient condition. And I think the thing that I learned a lot from these individuals is, um, the 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 concept of personalized medicine as opposed to protocolizing everything yeah. so for the yeah. longest time i used to get a lot of grief you know from my coordinators um, especially when uh, you know we were starting to get busy like why can't we just protocolize and i always said like no two individuals are the same you know what the drug does to the body and what the body yeah. does to the drug is different for two individuals um, and so the thing that I um, learned from these individuals was like you really had to try to understand the patient and you had to listen to the patient. So when I was with Eli Friedman, the first question that he would ask the patient, he would turn to him like, what is his name? Like he would ask my name to the patient. And I would spend like 10 minutes telling the patient, when he's going to ask you, please, this is my name. <laughs> because he wanted to know, did the patient have an influence enough yeah. To like remember me, yeah. to like remember, you know, uh, was I relevant or significant to this individual who is out there, you know, seeking, um, you know, medical attention. And those were things that I kind of like thought that were so important at that time. I felt like it was annoying. I'm like, I don't have an easy name. So, you know, yeah. they're, they're forgetting it, but that doesn't mean. But that was not the point that he was trying to make. The, the point that he was trying to make is trying to know the person. I had to know the patient and the patient had to know me. Uh -huh. um, and you have to be comfortable because now there are a lot of therapies that are coming in. And it's just been such a refreshing um, change in the culture. Like I wanted to be a transplant nephrologist because there wasn't enough happening in general nephrology. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden there's so much happening in general nephrology that I want to take some of those things and take it to my transplant space and uh, or the lessons that I've learned from the transplant to take it to the uh, to the to the uh, general nephrology yeah. space, and this was all because of like the lessons I learned on how to like you know it has to make sense. Like today, I talked to a 27, 26 year old who has IgA nephropathy, uh -huh. and like you know I literally you know highlighted and read the things and tried to explain to him the therapies that have come out and how I've started him on the first therapy and we've been able to get to a point and then like uh, why I started him on the second therapy and how I might add a third therapy on to like control what it is mm -hmm. so he has to have a clear idea of you know what the disease is so you know the, you know the three yeah. W's the why is this <clears throat> happening what is the problem where is the problem and what are mm -hmm. we going to do about it and mm -hmm. in terms of being able to collectively make a decision. Um, so I think those were the lessons that I learned and to talk uh, to the, the progressive nephrology that you're talking about, mm -hmm. because uh, nephrology as a field, we didn't have a whole lot of therapies. So there's been a reluctance or hesitance in, you know, like absorbing anything new that comes in, because historically we've been very slow compared to like transplant. Yeah. Somebody gets a transplant, we slam them with three drugs. We've mm -hmm. like always, we've already been aggressive. And, you yeah. know, I feel like that will change in our field. And it is important because we do, as a country, as a nation, spend a lot of money uh, in the kidney space. Yeah, uh, yeah, an obscene amount of money, right? An yeah. obscene amount of money. Yeah, absolutely. Got me down a rabbit hole and I was looking at a message here. We got a, a guest that uh, her father is newly uh, diagnosed with kidney failure and... Uh, when is a good time to talk about transplant? Is there a stage in GFR that people should be thinking about transplant? 
Uh, really, uh, ideally, it would be before they went on dialysis, just like there's like yeah. official the first initiative preemptively. preemptively. Yeah. Uh, the preemptive transplant uh, is one of the goals that was set up when the executive order went in, like yeah. how many home dialysis, yeah. how many preemptive transplant. There was like a, and there was a goal. So, you know, when you are when you're the GFR is less than 20 mil, m, m, mils per minute, you can start accumulating time. But that doesn't mean that you can be listed. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you should be starting to have these discussions so you can actually plan having living donors uh, that yeah. might potentially be uh, candidates. So you don't want to, like, you know, do that when you um, kind of, like, need it. You have right. to, like, have prepared it just like we do yeah. uh, for fistulas. Uh, and there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of information on, like, um, you know, centers uh, that are close by, and, and that becomes important because you know you do um, you do want to be at a center that um, you you do want to be at a center that gives you a, the highest rate of getting transplanted, yeah. and that's a concept that you know even transplant physicians are very um, poor in trying to explain. You know, I was. Uh, at a meeting where one of, I'm not gonna name names, but one of the biggest names in transplant was sort of suggesting that there isn't an advantage of being listed at two centers in the same city, which mm. is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. You can be listed in two cities and have a completely different chance of getting a transplant. And it becomes <clears throat> very important. Mm -hmm. And one of the concepts that has become important is what is, uh, not like how many transplants you do, but what is your transplant rate? In other words, the same, same way they are yeah. assessing dialysis yeah. units. Yeah. Like if you had 100 people that are on dialysis for dialysis units, they're right. looking at what percentage of those patients are on the transplant list. That's right. right. Yeah. Because folks weren't being put on uh, transplants. Yeah. Uh, for, for us on the transplant side, they're looking at if I had 100 people that I was responsible for, how many people got transplanted at the end of the year? Right. It's so a metric of quality. It's a metric of, and then you yeah. did you have good outcomes because you can't right. just transplant. Right. So so all of a sudden, instead of looking at the number of transplants or outcomes, uh, folks are paying attention to what the transplant rate is. So right. you don't want to just be parked at a place that you're <clears> thinking you're on the list, but they have the worst transplant rate. Right. Uh, so these are things that uh, I encourage patients to you know find out about because all of this is public information. Yeah. You can go to the websites the um, SRTR, which is the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. And there's also an amazing website created by a transplant patient uh, called the Transplant Coach. The transplant and you, Coach. Co okay. And you can like put up your uh, zip codes and all that. It will show you the nearby and how far you want to travel. It will show you the ones that you The centers are, you should be applying for. That, that might get you a transplant fastest, that's, that's, depending upon the blood group, depending upon all these things. Um, I, I actually re tried to reach out to the patient uh, who had created that website. It's an amazing website because it tries to factor in the airline connections to the city and all that stuff. Wow. Just, just very amazing. Wow, you should have them on a podcast. Oh, no, uh, you already know. I was thinking that. I mean, <laughs> that's something that I'll be happy to come back with them. That uh, would be awesome. And you know, just to your point uh, of sharing this sort of information, uh, I've seen you sharing information in in our encounters with with everybody, right? The entire group in the professional conferences, even as you're walking through the hallway, right? Where you're making connections. And uh, by the way, um, people remember your name now. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and and I, I, that's what it was. I want to tap into that. Is you know, I love that what he did to you. Uh, you know, hey, what's his name, right? That's awesome. It, it's something that as I've educated people over the years, I, I've kind of done it the reverse, right? And it's like, hey, if you want to take care of Dr. Kazi, like you should probably remember things about Dr. Kazi, right? Uh, so I always think about that from the patient side. Do you remember their daughter's name when they walk in? Do you remember their son? Their, you know, do you remember why they're coming to dialysis? in the case of dialysis centers, why they're coming there. They said they want to finish a book. They said they want to see somebody graduate from high school, whatever it is. So I, I love that it, it went back to you as the provider. Like, are they remembering you? Because how are you going to sit on their shoulder when they're making decisions at home, right? Or when they're contemplating this way, that way? You've got to have some sort of subconscious effect on them, right? Absolutely. Uh, and I think um, it goes both ways, right? Like yeah. I... Um, uh, as I said, it's a partnership, and at the mm -hmm. end of the day, we're trying to make somebody feel better uh, how they feel so they can go back to their life and enjoy life. And uh, uh, it does, 
it does kind of like I don't I don't do that intentionally, but somehow I'll forget my car keys. But I will remember the patient that I saw today was a Green Bay Packers fan. Uh, so, so somehow it sticks to me, and it does um, you know it, it kind of like builds up uh, a relationship and partnership again because I love this field. You're in the long term of it. This yeah. is a marathon. This isn't a sprint that you scope somebody and you're done, and you know yeah. you have to come back in five years or something like that. It's like. Um, you're, they know that you're there for them and uh, you'll try to do the best uh, in all possible circumstances. Dr. Kazi, let's, let's shift a little bit. Um, it's been great to get to know you uh, a little bit more and I know that we got many more conferences ahead of us so we'll, and maybe some podcasts in, in store. Uh, coach, uh, transplant coach, right? Yeah, definitely totally. want, or some I'm, patients want, so we should have some patients up. come over, yeah. Yeah, uh, so let's focus, let, let's shift our focus over there. Uh, and I know we've been talking a lot about the whole purpose and why you do this, but um, from your perspective, what are the most critical factors for people to consider when preparing for a transplant? So you mentioned preemptively um, at a certain point getting on that list, right? Uh, you're on the list. What are the things that you got to keep in mind in preparation? Okay, so this is a great question because I feel like um, somehow as the patients go down the CKD, the chronic kidney disease spectrum, there comes a point where their involvement with the nephrologist is so much that they stop their relationship with their primary care physician, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I feel, is one of the biggest uh, sort of mistakes that happens along the journey of a, di uh, of a CKD patient. Mm. And the reason is because for us to be able to transplant someone, um, we have to have certain things as checklists to make sure that they're going to be okay after the transplant. And it comes down to two things. One, can they safely go through the surgery without having a cardiovascular uh, risk? Years of dialysis messes it up. Like, you know, yeah. our bodies were supposed to get rid of these toxins on a daily basis that aren't coming out of our body anymore. Mm -hmm. They're accumulating in our organ systems over time. So there is a higher cardiovascular risk, right? So the mortality of a dialysis patient is like an 80 year old or something. So right. like we have to do whatever we can to give them good dialysis, keep their cardiovascular risk low, um, and then be able to give them a transplant so that it normalizes back again their mm -hmm. cardiovascular risk. So the biggest thing is making sure that their, you know, their calcium, their phosphorus, all those things that are causing the calcification in their body is, is under control. So their um, cardiovascular uh, testing has been done on a timely basis. They're seeing a cardiologist from time to time. More importantly, when I talk about that gap in care from losing touch with the primary care, I am surprised in how many of these patients now feel that their primary care doctor is the nephrologist. Yeah. And as a result, they're not getting their mammograms done. They're not getting their pap smear done. They're gotcha. not getting their colonoscopies yeah. done. Um, and then at, we as a transplant center, we can't transplant them right. until they've had all this cancer screening. Mm -hmm. So that delays the ability to list them because I can't get the colonoscopy fast enough. Mm -hmm. And I am baffled mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how, you know, they're like 65 years old and they've never had a colonoscopy or they've never had a mammogram done. And then you will be surprised on how many things we find out, like how many cancers we pick up. So it's almost yeah. like there's a benefit yeah. of sending us uh, to a point that I feel that first I'm a primary care physician because I'm like, you know, doing all these things. Uh, and then I'm a nephrologist making sure the phosphorus counts. And then finally I'm a transplant guy, you know. Yeah. But I can't get to the transplant part without actually having gone through level one and level two of making sure that you are going to be able to go through surgery without having a heart attack, without having mm -hmm. a stroke, without having the new kidney steal blood away from your leg and ending up you having an amputation. Yeah. Um, so the surgeon has to be okay with that. And that's for us, giving you immunosuppressive drugs, you're not going to have infections and you know cancers um, or any other issues that are going to be uh, detrimental. You might have gotten a kidney, but you're going to have uh, problems. The number one uh, cause of us losing a kidney transplant is losing the patient because they had poor diabetes and yeah. you know cardio. So I think the biggest thing in being able to prep for the transplant is making sure you have all these things and walk into the transplant center with all these things so we can list you next week. Yeah, you know yeah. you've had an echo done, you've had a stress test done, you've had a cardiac clearance done. You don't have any abnormalities on your colonoscopy. You've had your prostate check because half of our work is trying to plug in. Uh, all these other specialties that mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. to go through to get them listed. 
So, so how often do you have somebody come in that primed in that manner? Oh my God, I'd say less than 10%. Wow. Yeah. And that I feel like, you know, somebody has to write a paper about it. Like, yeah. you know, why aren't folks getting their cancer screenings done? And which yeah. has become really hard now, especially after the COVID. You know, we, we don't even know what the impact of COVID is when right. you look at how many people didn't get their mammograms and colonoscopies and like all these, uh, yeah. they're like four months, six months delays in being able to get to an office yeah. when, um, when you know, something should have taken like a month, two months. So I have like this checklist with all the things that you need that I, I'm a visual person that I give. I'm like, kind of like, go check, 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 check. When all, you've done all of these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I try to give that to dialysis units ahead so that yeah, they yeah. know that, uh, them, and again, like, the, yeah. and it's important to like have these communications so then folks know what the di- uh, transplant center is going to be asking for, rather than you waiting three months to get to a transplant center and then be told what you could have been doing for the past three months and just walk in and be able to get listed. And again, these are all the metrics that are going to be used. How long did it take the dialysis unit to send a patient to transplant? How long did it take mm-hmm. us to see a patient? And how long did it take us to list the patient? And how long did it take us to transplant the patient, right? All these uh, metrics uh, are very quantifiable, yeah, right? Yeah. So, and, and at the end of the day, this is quality. This is a, you know, uh, this is a patient that is bit trying to find their way through all these um, sort of different gates that they have to get through to get onto the transplant along the journey. So, so tell, I mean, <clears throat> I want to understand what, you know, the root of that, like touch points, frequency with nephrology, dialysis, you lose sight of primary. It, it, is that what it is? That it's like they're, they're mistaken that now I, I see this doctor, so... I don't have to go to anybody else, or what, what exactly is the well, disconnect uh, there? So I, I haven't actually done a deep analysis of it, but it's very simple to kind of just guess the fact that they now have to come to a dialysis unit three times a week, you know, and they recover on their non-dialysis days. Yeah. Where are they going to find the time? So yeah. usually when they come in, Exhaustion, fatigue, they just yeah. let their nurse know, oh, I'm having an itch, I'm having this. And yeah. usually they will call the nephrologist. Nephrologist is going to get a verbal order and all that stuff. And and nephrologists, by and large, are great primary care physicians. We know how to yeah. deal with diabetes and right. hypertension, especially in the face of kidney failure. Mm-hmm. But then we do lose sight. I mean, it'd be a very easy study to look at what percentage of patients that were referred over to a transplant center did not have mammogram, pap yeah. smears, and all that stuff, yeah. then that they could have been listed because some of these simple things. So I always encourage dialysis units when I'm doing an educational component. You saw me do that in Palm Springs, yeah. where I say, please, please, please encourage your patients yeah. to go see your primary care. So some of these things, th- that is the responsibility of the primary care to make sure the cancer screening is up to date based on what the societies recommend uh, on, on based on age, sex, and other criteria. So I feel uh, simple things like this would facilitate the ability of the patients mm-hmm. to be listed promptly and then them to get transplanted. Well, I'm, I'm curious from our audience, uh, and we'll get them to chime in, but how many of you are having those discussions with patients about the frequency or whether they're seeing their primaries? Does it come up in your dialysis centers? Do your, are your patients talking about it with you? Are you talking about it with them? Um, so yeah, please chime in, those of you who are working in dialysis centers or getting dialysis in centers or maybe have previously uh, got dialysis. Thanks, Dr. Kazi. That, that was... Uh, Great advice there. Uh, so, what about advancements? You know, we, you shared a lot. At like I said, it, to me, it was like two weeks of information packed into mm-hmm. an, an hour. Um, there, there was like some recent excitement about the Xeno transplantations, or uh, these were uh, allografts from pig, pigs. Yes, that's correct. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? That and then, you know, what really is exciting in the world of transplant right now? And again, you shared some of that at sure. that last conference. Yeah, yeah, of course. As I mentioned, it's not just transplant; it's like the entire CKD space. There's yeah. so many therapies coming for what we call rare kidney diseases, whether it's IgA nephropathy, we like literally had no medications for it, and all of a sudden we yeah. we have so many therapies for that. And again, all of these sort of like are intertwined in it because at the end of the day the diseases that cause the kidney failure have the potential of coming back into the kidney. Mm -hmm. So I kind of lump them down into like better diagnostics that are available uh, and better therapies that are available um, to protect the kidney the second time around and better diagnostics like genetic testing and like, you know, the ability to detect uh, the DNA of the donor kidney being different than, you know, for example, I gave you a kidney transplant, it would Mm -hmm. be able to detect 
my DNA floating around in your blood if it goes up to realize that there's like, you know, something going on like way early than when the kidney numbers have been going up. So gotcha. the diagnostic space has really started to help us out in being able to detect uh, injury early so we can put up the therapies that yeah. are now um, yeah. sort of available. Um, so um, on the um, uh, the therapy side of it, I break it down into you know pharma- pharmacotherapy and then uh, other novel therapy that is out there. So in pharmacotherapy, there's like better uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of immune and non-immune therapies that have been available because, as I mentioned, I had an IgA patient that you know I kind of like now have on multiple different therapies and protecting them. And these are things that patients need to be able to know. People need to go be able to go like, do I have a genetic condition if I have so many family members? Mm-hmm. Before we would just chalk it down to hypertension, but now you have genetic testing that you can do. If so, one of the things that I basically test, I ask them is like, do you have cousins of you know brothers, sisters? And if the answer is yes, then I do a genetic testing and I'll be, you know, I'm so shocked in all the conditions that I have uncovered and then I had to go study on because we just thought it was hypertension because we didn't really know what the ther- what, what the things were. And as a result of that, we now have better therapies that are targeted towards those conditions yeah. that we're not only using in the CKD space, but then taking that and using that in the transplant space as well. So it becomes really important for a patient to be educated about not only what is available out there from a detecting uh, you know what the condition originally was uh, and what the therapies now are because they can be extended into the transplant space gotcha. of course the biggest um, problem that we've had is a shortage of organs so xenotransplantation or getting transplants from um, you know uh, animals um, you know um, um, like uh, pigs or was sort of like a very exciting uh, development that happened last um, year and you probably heard it was the first human xenotransplant that um, was done. Uh, Around that time, I had a student that was interested in a project, and I actually had him talk to dialysis patients in a dialysis unit and see what their thoughts were. Mm -hmm. And this was before that patient, the xenotransplant patient actually died. So despite all this excitement, a third of the patients still were a little skeptical about, um, you know, whether they would accept a uh, kidney from um, from a pig, and a lot of that is because there was a certain amount of uncertainty. And yeah. it's uh, it's um, to your point, like the first eleven dialysis patients died before the first dialysis patient took on. Yeah, um, the first four or five xenotransplant patients died, but that didn't prevent the company that is looking into it getting like a, a sixteen million dollar or so, you know, a boost to kind of like refine the keep techniques. going, keep yeah. going. Because the two things that what we want is to prevent any transmission of infections. Because uh-huh. um, as humans, we're constantly surrounded by bacteria, viruses, fungi. Yeah. And some of those things, like the viruses, don't leave our body. They stay in our DNA. Uh-huh. You know, when we were little, we got chicken pox, right? And then that virus doesn't leave us. It stays in our cells. And later in life, it comes back a zoster. Uh-huh. Same thing with pigs. They might have certain viruses that were incorporated into their DNA. And then if we do do a transplant, is there a chance that we will unleash some virus that might basically potentially Been cause... sitting there dormant. Sitting there yeah. dormant, and the animals might be able to deal with it, but that might be something that the humans yeah, yeah. may get impacted mm-hmm. by. So as a result, a lot of research is going into identifying any potential viral infections and therapies that can be instituted, and even better, just like eliminate them from the DNA. Mm-hmm. So a lot of mm-hmm. the work that goes on to the, you know, in the... The, uh, the genetic, uh, the uh, sort of the, the making of these kidneys is trying to refine these things where they're going to take out the yeah. potential viral infections or the rejection that might happen because, mm-hmm. you know, this may trigger off a clotting. You know, it's kind of like the same yeah. way if you get like a Mutant wrong response. blood type, yeah. uh, you know, you have like a massive amount of cell breakdown and all that. So mm-hmm. how do we how do we like delete those genes Mm -hmm. or add genes that are protective so like basically delete genes man that's just insane like for me it's been going on for a long time you have have the seedless watermelon and all these things that they've been doing uh, genetics on it's just now organs Mm -hmm. um so but there will be people like you know mr slayman who was willing to accept the risk of taking a kidney unfortunately passed away but like there was an advancement uh in trying to get uh, to where we're trying to move the needle. Um, so I don't see this happening in the next one year, two years, but eventually, you know, something down the road as this gets refined and we're able to go do a deep dive. And So it is still, y- you said, even post, I guess, initial wave of 
experiments or trials? Would they consider trials? What, what, yeah, uh, yeah, they have to be under a clinical trial. trial. Yes. So, so even after this, there was an injection of funding to continue the work? Yes, there was. That's uh, awesome. On September 4th. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's great. It was great like news. 16 million, some venture cap. Yeah. Uh, uh, still believed in the company that's uh, eGenesis that's looking into this. Okay. What, what about the, uh, the artificial type of stuff or the... Um, the stem cells or the, re what do they call it, the rescaffling of it? Yeah, so it's still very um, preliminary stages. It's not here for the patients that might actually be waiting on yeah. um, a kidney. You know, eventually the science um, is sort of like evolving to get us there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is still going to be some years before we actually see that as something that might be available on a commercial routine basis that folks wouldn't have to... Uh, wait, like your question on like, um, we wouldn't have to wait, we just like get through it. And I don't see it happening anytime soon, though. Dr. Kazi, where are we at as far as the number of transplanted kidneys in the United States? About 20,000. 20,000 per year. year. Yeah. And and what about the prevalence of transplants? So, so overall, about 100,000 people are on the list, mm -hmm. about 80,000 or about close to 90,000 now of them are waiting for a kidney. Okay. Yeah. So. And, and what about the prevalence of living with transplant? Uh, I, I'd say about of those about f uh, 10,000 uh, no about five it varies from center to center and mm -hmm. the center could be doing about 40 percent live donors uh, mm -hmm. to like some centers that are doing 10 percent so depending upon what patient population you are but um, I have to look at the exact numbers but I'd say about 5,000 live donors a year okay wow mm -hmm. wow what are some myths about transplant are, are there myths or misconceptions that people have about transplant whether it's a positive, like it's super easy, or it's too hard, or I'll never get it. What What do you see most frequently? Um, so I think like there's all kinds, right? There's mm -hmm. some positive, there's some negative ones, and what it comes down to one common theme. It's like there hasn't been good amount of education that has been imparted to the patient. Mm -hmm. um, and I I love um, to kind of like have to explain this in a way that again things like these podcasts or like patient experience or Mark's journey. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were more of those out there, I yeah. think some of these would kind of like go away. Uh, what does make it hard because folks, um, you know, may have such a wrong concept of it. They're like, oh, I rather, I'm, I don't want to wait ten years. I'd rather just, uh, yeah. just um, rather be on dialysis than to have to put an effort and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, uh, folks haven't been educated enough. All, all the different kinds of kidneys there are out there that they, if they're willing to accept, they might be able to shorten their wait times mm -hmm. uh, by listing in multiple places, even within the same city, as I mentioned. Uh, there are things that folks have not uh, really taken the advantage of knowing yeah. what transplant centers give them the best odds or shot at getting a kidney transplant and do they have great outcomes. And mm -hmm. all of our work is quantifiable. Like for dialysis, what is your urea reduction ratio? What is your hemoglobin? Yeah. Because we, we go by numbers. Like for mm -hmm. us, it's like how many transplants did we do? How many of them are alive at one year? How many mm -hmm. of them are alive at three years? You can look at all that information mm -hmm. and that's information that you can make a decision on, is it worth getting a transplant uh, and being off dialysis? For us uh, in Southern California, a lot of patients are from other countries. Yeah. Like I can, I can, even if somebody's helping me translate a language, I somehow know the question that they are asking me and it brings a smile to my face. Mm -hmm. The question is, can I go see my family? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen them in years. Can mm -hmm. I go travel to the Philippines or Vietnam? I haven't <clears throat> seen my family in many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that freedom coming back uh, to them is something that is, uh, you know, these are the things that you want to know. Yeah. It is worth getting a kidney that may not have perfect kidney function, but it's, you know, so this idea that I have to wait for a perfect kidney or I should not take a kidney from somebody that might have been using drugs in the past. Yeah. Um, there yeah. are all these things that they would rather not take a kidney and then suffer the consequences of dialysis. And to some extent it is, we haven't done our job in educating patients enough about um, you know, the risks and benefits of transplant yeah. uh, versus remaining on dialysis and, and the complications associated with that. Well, I, I've, again, I've kind of watched through some of your, I guess, online mentions or content, and I've heard from colleagues that were captured in content that you've completely changed their perspective on, I, I guess, paraphrasing Morales, uh, I'm looking at kidneys that I previously would have never looked at. I know who said that. 
Uh, but I think what it uh, came down to was like when I first came um, to Los Angeles, um, as I mentioned, there's so many transplant centers. Um, you wanted to like kind of like base your decisions on what you m- kind of like your assessment of the donor was. Yeah. Um, and so, again, goes to the part that you have to be a primary care physician first. Uh-huh. You have to be a nephrologist next. And then you have to be an immunologist, a transplant guy. So unless you are looking through Clairvoyant those, as well, right? <laughs> you have to look at uh, insomniac because all these decisions are in the middle of the night. Yeah. Unless you're looking through these three lenses when you're choosing a, a donor, you are, the easiest thing to do is, oh, let's just skip it. Uh-huh. But then you're like, wait, you know, why not? And like, maybe not for somebody that I feel has done 15 years on the list. Uh, maybe for somebody that, that has nothing to lose because they don't have enough wait time, uh-huh. that this kidney might still give you a, you know, a great kidney function. Yeah. Um, you know, it may not move you. I explained to patients, you have one, two, three, four, five, you're over here, you're stage five. Uh-huh. I could move you here with a live donor transplant. Right. But you might move over here and to the Thing that I mentioned, we have better diagnostics and better therapeutics to keep you here. Yeah. And you're better yeah, off yeah. here than to be on dialysis waiting for this perfect kidney when you have these discussions. Yeah. Uh, and to some extent, you know, I think it started out with some centers. Um, um, it's, it's funny because there is uh, that website that I talked about. Mm-hmm. There is a, a sort of like a metric called hard to place kidneys. Mm-hmm. These are kidneys that went through 100 centers or so before somebody accepted Got them. you. So yeah. I had a student actually look up. Clearance what, rack. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of <Sorry>. like, <laughs> no, no, but some of these clearance racks are steel. Some of them are yeah. really good. Yeah. So I actually had somebody look at what um, what percentage of centers in the country were doing a you know good chunk a, a third of their kidneys like that? It was only about ten percent. Oh. Um, so actually, um, uh, it kind of was in line with one of my friends who's a great transplant nephrologist, Alex Lupi at Paris Transplant Group from oh. France, uh-huh. who did a paper who looked at like about sixty percent of the kidneys that get discarded in the United States actually would get used in France. But the, the liability to a transplant program, to yeah. a physician, on oh, should I already take yeah. it? it? Makes us more likely to discard these kidneys that accept it. Uh-huh. But if you've had these discussions with the patient, not in the middle of the night, but before, like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do, they're more likely to accept it. And then when yeah. you start seeing outcomes that are good, then you will have people start believing and yeah. saying, you know, and There's again, to a proof point in the that, pudding, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, not the pudding, the creatinine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's a good proof creatinine, the, cre- the proof right. of the creatinine. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, Dr. Kazi, what, what are some of the ethical considerations uh, or maybe some of the challenges today? Uh, I, I've, I've had friends, colleagues that kidney failure hits and first thing they said was, you know, uh, I'm going to go somewhere else because of wait times and I can do this, you know, what, whatever that is, whether it's monetize or leverage relationship, whatever it is to get a kidney on the other side of the world. Um, so practicing here in, locally in Southern California, like what are some of the ethical dilemmas that you face on a day to day around kidney transplant? Sure. So it's a great question because, you know, obviously we do have folks um, in the United States who have connections with other countries and mm-hmm. uh, it's illegal in the United States uh, to purchase a kidney or like right. any kind of transactions happening. Though a couple of weeks ago, I think it's a congressman up from Bakersfield that has initiated um, some sort of a bill. Uh, where a live donor could get compensated uh, in terms of being able to. So it's in itself a big eth- ethical issue because mm-hmm. it's, it has potential of, um, you know, kind of like disadvantaging or taking advantage of the patients that might be of lower socioeconomic because they might find it as a way out. I think there's like some sort of a, you know, tax deductible or something of 50000 or 60000 uh, I've kind of like... Um, always try to shy away from like something like this. Oh. Uh, yeah, if you want to give somebody health insurance for the rest of their life, just like, you right. know, right. You're, you're, you're enlisted in a, as a Marine, you get health benefits and all that, you're mm-hmm. saving a life over here. Yeah. Uh, why don't we give you health insurance, especially if it's transplant related, we'll take mm-hmm. care of you for the rest of your life. If mm-hmm. you have some, some of those things, and again, then there's ethical issues as well. That's not the way to solve our health uh, crisis that exists, a health mm-hmm. insurance crisis that exists uh, in this country. Uh, but, you know, um, 
you could go to some other countries that have excellent transplant programs, but it still seems to create more complications when they come back because you know the the, the handoff the yeah. uh, isn't perfect. Yeah. Have, do I have patients that are doing well having gotten kidneys in Mexico or mm -hmm. Taiwan or gone down to India and all that? Yeah, because some of those places have cutting edge. Uh, but uh, more likely than not, it, you are better off first attempting to. Ex uh, explore the options within the United States yeah. at centers that have uh, short wait times. If you have the ability to go to another country, you should be uh, have the ability to go to fly, you know, to Either, Iowa or yeah. you know Midwest yeah, yeah. where the wait times are shorter, or go to Nebraska. Um, and again, the Transplant Coach, that website that I talked about, mm -hmm. will help you identify transplant centers that have an extremely short wait time. If not, come to me. I'll figure a way of getting it. So, so there are like when you talk about licensure and certification of healthcare facilities, right? Different sort of operations. You, you would call like certain localities uh, landmines, right? Like don't do it there, certain things, right? I don't know if I'd get you in trouble for asking this, but are there landmines in the United States? Like, hey, don't have, don't be looking for a transplant in this state. Well, it's so simple because everybody's report card comes out every six months. Mm -hmm. You know, every transplant center's um, transplant rate and outcomes come up as a five-star bar graph. Okay. So it's kind of like going and shopping on Amazon. Mm -hmm. you know, it's Amazon Prime Day today. Is it on the compare, or where do you, where do you no, find it's this? No, it's, um, you can go to the, if you just Google compare transplant program and the okay. SRTR, or you just okay. look, uh, um, you know, some of these websites, mm -hmm. they will kind of like give you, like you put in a zip code and how far you're willing to travel. Mm -hmm. It will rank order what uh, what is the transplant rate. So again, yeah. for five stars and outcome. So you want to have like at least three, four stars on both of them to feel reassured. You don't want mm -hmm. like, you know, have like one bars on each one of them. So again, because the, the federal government pays so much money on this, they look at transplant programs and their outcomes and we strive by. And that's why some of our transplant colleagues are like a little risk averse because they don't want to be dinged. There yeah. was like a, yeah. a pediatric heart transplant program in Houston that shut down. Um, they weren't going to get like Medicare funding. Uh, but again, they were trying to get people. So these are things that, you know, uh, needs a sort of like a communication from the transplant centers to the uh, to the CMS and yeah. to like yeah. say, hey, you know, we are trying, we are doing a high risk population. Like, you know, Southern California. Yeah, how do you I have to have that like out? 16 different language lines translated. I didn't have that in upstate New York. Everybody yeah, yeah. spoke English. I'm the one that had an accent. Mm -hmm. You know, over here I had uh, accent in Buffalo. Uh, so uh, <laughs> just over, not a Buffalo over accent. Over here I have <laughs> like you know I have to have, have to have I have to have 16 different languages. Imagine yeah. the strike I'm up against. Yeah. So have, to have outcomes that are above national average, it, I'm just so proud in our team when that happens because we just know we have to work so much harder than some of the other centers. Can uh, you tell me a little? bit about the accolades of of your current program or the programs that you well you know like i said i try to stay humble <laughs> yeah <laughs> because if i don't things happen but again this is for folks to go and look at you know uh on the website it's public information that mm -hmm. you can compare transplant okay. programs at. Mm -hmm. okay uh let's see doctor so wrapping up and i i want to be considerate of your time i know you've got some personal time planned this evening uh some of the little personal time that you get uh we, we've talked about, I think, future trends already, um, but, you know, outside of medicine, outside of football, what's the, uh, let me take that back, outside of medicine, outside of the impact that you want to have on your children, what is the legacy of Dr. Yasser Kazi? Well, I... I really am passionate about preventing folks from going um, down the CKD spectrum because mm -hmm. it cuts down your years of life. Think about it. And you're telling me about your, yeah. um, you know, how important is it for you to have your daughter, your grandchildren around and all that stuff. Yeah. So losing a family member. And again, I, I I had a grandmother who was a dialysis patient. I had dad who had CKD. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was like an unexpected phone call that I got when he passed away. And it's still oh, taking me you know, four yeah. or five years to recover. I'm like, mm -hmm. I do this for a living. How did I miss something on him yeah. and all that stuff? So I think um, you want people to be around for their family members. So like mm -hmm. prevention, I feel, is the key. And if I can educate people in like the new therapies or therapies or diagnostics that are out there in preventing the progression of kidney disease, uh, in preventing, or, or like if they are unfortunately on uh, dialysis, how best to like take care of themselves while on their dialysis until they can get a transplant mm -hmm. and have a meaningful impact along this. You know, 
um, you know, culturally in my culture, they say that, you know, once you're dead, there's only a couple ways you can still get the benefits that you left behind talking about legacy. And one of the thing is if you impart a knowledge to somebody that still is getting used, you get credit for whatever it's used. So I've never right. been a guy that, you know, people are like, oh, um, did you like send them the entire slide deck, send it to them in a PDF so they don't use it? Yeah, I'm yeah. like, yeah, I yeah. don't care. Yeah. I mean, if I did something that benefited somebody that, you know, passed it on, um, I, I feel I feel great. You know, like, so uh, I'm now at a new transplant center than I was before. I'm kind of like part-time at USC and, mm -hmm. um, and full-time uh, at Providence. Uh, and, nice. and, and, and so uh, the fact that, you know, uh, other transplant centers might be doing what we're doing, it doesn't bother me that oh you know these you know these were sort of like um, the folks that you know used to work with us are now at the transplant center. Yeah. Um, if somebody is benefiting because of uh, you know things that I learned from Dr. Venuto and Dr. Friedman and I worked with Dr. Naragi, the best transplant surgeon that I had the pleasure of working. I feel in Southern California or or like period, an amazing guy. Uh, so like things that we have learned. So it's like, pass it on, pass it forward, pass yeah. it on. Yeah. Don't hold on to it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I feel if uh, if that got around in terms of every spectrum of the CKD, you know, in, pre in prevention, diagnostic, and then once they get transplanted and being able to get a kidney for a person that is gonna have, they're gonna have it for life, uh, I think I'd be really happy. That That's that's great sentiment. So I, I've shared on the podcast before, my first job, Dr. Kazi, was I was a construction worker, right? And I, I remember when I was a constructor, I, I worked with my dad. And he was like the type that like, just pick it up and go, like run. And I was like, there's a forklift right there, right? But he was like, nope, it's fast. We can just get it done, right? Let's break our back. And my dad's a hard, hard worker, right? I, I can remember at that time, like when I, when I knew a secret, like not wanting to share it with people. Because it's like, you know, how am I going to climb up to be the top of this trade, right? It's like I gotta know stuff that other people don't know. But when I moved over into into healthcare and worked as a dialysis tech, and then a biomed and water specialist, and, and now do other things, right? Uh, that that spirit of education that you just shared, like I, I've always seen it as it's not for me. It does no good for me to have this shit in my head. Like I have to give it to other people so they can do something with it, iterate on it, apply it to their own life. So I 100% I agree with that. Like, um, I'm happy that we have folks like you in the space. Oh, we're lucky to have folks like you that's spreading out this information. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I want to uh, kind of round out the, the evening for us. Are there any last thoughts from you, Dr. Kazi? No. Uh, I Again, thank you so much for having me. I think uh, it is such an important time uh, in our space, in, in our nephrology space, in the CKD space, uh, that, you know, education needs to be the primary focus for us to get the word out there. Yeah. Um, I call it, you know, you've heard me say this, I call it we're in the middle of a Honda epidemic, like hypertension, obesity, non-compliance, <laughs> diabetes, you know, atherosclerosis. It is rampant. One yeah. in eight uh, you, uh, Americans have chronic kidney disease. Yeah. And, and one in nine of them don't even know they have chronic kidney disease. Right. So yeah. uh, if you have a family member that has kidney disease, your risk of getting family disease is significant. So yeah. an early detection can prevent us from going down the spectrum. No. I don't want to ever see patients that need to see me. If yeah. you can get to not dialysis and not need transplant, I will finally have a work-life balance. So well, let, let me give go, me my work-life balance. Let me go there then. So it kind of back to that last question. Um, and I've said this a lot of times because I've been a big proponent for home dialysis like my whole life. I grew up around dialysis, right? It's like, right. that's what I know. And I've uh, been like, hey, you know, home dialysis, because that's what I grew up with. My uncle was on home dialysis. He lived a great life. He did stuff with the kids and, you know, built hot rods and stuff like this. Then when I worked in the clinics, it was like, oh, you're, you're missing a lot, right? But when I, when I would tell people that are coming into the space to become new techs or new nurses that, you know, home dialysis, you, quite often I would hear like, well, what would we still have a job? And I would say, I would welcome the day where I don't have a job with, when people took things like dialysis into their own AMS, and better yet, a day where we didn't need dialysis. So I'm curious from you, Dr. Kazi, let's, let's go to that world. Just, <laughs> I know it's a, a very hypothetical world. What are you gonna do tomorrow when there's no more kidney disease? I think I will, um, 
first of all, we're still struggling to get people insulin. Like yeah. It was discovered in 1908 yeah. or whatever. So yeah. we're still struggling. Congress is still fighting to get... I, I think you and I are going to be working in this space. But I do too. if if you know it comes to that, I would be the most delighted man that there are people that are living a healthy life. And I will go back and join your uh, construction job and yeah. we'll work construction. <laughs> we'll, we'll end where you started. And go get I will in shape without we'll, uh, while we're earning money. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I think there are so many... Um, th- th- there's um, there's going to be so many healthcare related opportunities where we continue to like um, serve people and make their lives better. So uh, it, it shouldn't be a transition moving on from the CKD space. I'd be happy to do that. I would too. Dr. Kazi, where can we find you next? Are you have any speaking engagements that people can look, you know, look yeah, up or no, attend? Yeah, no, absolutely. There's always um, uh, sort of, uh, I try to put it on my Twitter account. Uh, and, you know, share it, share the handle with us, please. Sure, it's, I actually uh, took kidney transplant before anybody else did, but it okay. doesn't, the second, it's K- K-I-D-N-E-Y-T-R-A-N, <laughs> transplant without an A. Um, without an A. Uh, okay. The last A. Without a okay. last A. Got it. Um, and um, yeah, I, I actually put uh, this podcast last night. All right. Well, everybody, make sure to look up kidney transplant without the last A. Look up Dr. Kazi. Yeah, he's local here in Southern California. And uh, I think probably if you reach out to him on, on Twitter, that might be, or is it X now? Uh, okay. That might be a way that you can uh, you know ask some questions and and. Do you put out educational content yeah, there? Yeah, once in a while I put out educational content. All right. Yeah. So you put all your speaking engagements on there as well? Yes. And and what about uh, the end of this month? Will you be in San Diego? We're going to be in San Diego. I'm in San Diego, so we'll right. see each other there. Yeah, perfect. Let's hang out, and uh, you know, hopefully we get some downtime or for sure. your, that or your phone's going off, Dr. Kasi. <laughs> hey, thank, thank, you so thank you so much for you. joining us thank this you, evening. Yeah. This episode has been brought to you by Dialysis Education Services.